Hello, everyone. We are entering the portion of lectures which corresponds to chapter three in your textbook. And what has happened in the course so far is you've learned a bunch of computational techniques for solving linear equations, and you've learned about matrices, and you've learned about some of the things we use matrices for. And now we are going to want to introduce vocabulary to describe the sort of phenomena that you see when you solve linear equations. So you're already familiar with the phenomena we want to describe here, but we're going to be giving you concepts and vocabulary to talk about it with. And there are a lot of concepts and vocabulary, so there are going to be a lot of lectures this week. Um, so the first concept I'll tell you about are the image and the kernel of a matrix. And before we get abstract, let's get concrete, let's remember a homework problem. So here's a homework problem you all did. It involves cars driving through a bunch of one-way streets. And when you solve this problem, you hopefully got a bunch of linear equations that looked like this. And when you went and solved those linear equations, you found they didn't have a unique solution. Rather, they had a one-dimensional family of solutions. It could be parameterized with one, with one variable. Because when you did the row reduction, you got one free variable the way you parameterize that. And uh, there's more than one way to write this answer. So this may not be exactly what your answer looked like, but it should be close enough. Uh, another thing which you may or may not have noticed at the time, but is going to be important today, is that if you put some random numbers here on the right-hand side of these equations, then they weren't solvable at all. If you just put four random numbers on the right-hand side here and run row reduction, you'll get zero equals one, which means no solutions. These equations are solvable because these four numbers on the right-hand side have a special uh, property that 270 is the sum of 100, 150, and 20. So, um, so that's why they turned out to be solvable. So we're going to want to talk about both these phenomena, the fact that there was a one-dimensional family of solutions and the fact that these solutions were only solvable for certain values on the right-hand side we're going to want to talk about both of those phenomena today. But before we do, let's just see concretely why they happened in this problem. So the reason that we got a one-dimensional family of solutions, one way to think about it is, so here's one solution. One solution is that um, 270 cars drive along Winthrop, 150 of them continue along JFK, and Oh, sorry, 250 of them continue along JFK and 150 of them continue along Mount Auburn and no one at all drives along Dunster. So that's one solution. But then if some of the cars decide to cut across the corner and go directly along Dunster rather than going along three sides of this quadrilateral, that won't change the inflow or outflow of the traffic from this neighborhood at all. So, oh, the ambiguity here is that we can add a car along Dunster and subtract cars in the other three positions and get exactly the same traffic flow in and out of the neighborhood. So that's sort of where your one free parameter comes from. It's the freedom to choose whether to go around these three sides or whether to just go up this street. And then where does the condition that 270 is 100 plus 150 plus 20 come from? Well, 270, is the net inflow at this intersection. There are 270 cars coming in here. And then we have a net outflow of 20 cars going out here. We have a net outflow of 100 cars going out here. And we have a net outflow of 150 cars going out here. And because the total number of cars going in equals the total number of cars going out, our equations have solutions. If there were more cars going out than coming in, 
then this problem would be taking place in Detroit or sticking to the math, the equations would not be solvable because there's no term for creating cars. Okay. So now we want to introduce general vocabulary to talk about both of these, these phenomena. The question of when are a bunch of linear equations solvable and the question of when do they have multiple solutions and what kind of multiple solutions do they have. So the vector x here, that's my vector of variables, the variables that I called a, d, j, and w in the previous equation having to do with, with traffic flow. The matrix A is the matrix of coefficients, and the vector B is the vector of constants on the right-hand side. So for each of these questions, we're going to introduce a concept that describes the answer. The image of A tells us when equations are solvable, and the kernel of A tells us what ambiguity there is in solving the equations. So we're going to talk first about image. So the image of a matrix A is those vectors B where the equations AX equals B have a solution. So here's the matrix from our running example, from the traffic example. The image of those ma this matrix is going to be those vectors PQRS for which we can solve these four linear equations. And we noted before, you wouldn't be able to solve them for just any random PQRS it's only going to work out if um, Q is equal to P plus R plus S. I might have not quite said the right thing there, but I'm going to keep going. So anyways, the image is when you can solve these equations. Let me give you another way to think about the image. Let's give, an, let's give names to the columns of the matrix A, what's called the columns V1, V2, v3 and so forth, then if we multiply a by a column vector x1, x2, x3 and so forth, what we get is x1, v1 plus x2, v2 plus x3, v3 and so forth. So the image of a we could also describe as all the linear combinations like this of the columns of a. And I warned you there's going to be a lot of vocabulary we also call this the span of the vectors V1 through Vn. So image is a word that applies to a matrix. A matrix has an image, a list of vectors has a span, but it really means the exact same thing. Okay. And so just to hammer home what these concepts mean in our running example, here is the matrix A from our running example. The first column of that matrix is the vector over here. The second column of that matrix is the vector over here. And so we see the image of this matrix is the span of these four vectors. Also, or also we could say it's the set of all linear combinations of those four vectors. Okay, moving on to kernel. The kernel of A is those vectors W such that A W equals zero. So I told you the job of the kernel is to describe the ambiguity or the freedom in our solutions. And let's see why that works. So suppose we have one solution to our equation. Uh, let me flip back, let me flip ahead one slide. One solution to the traffic equations was this vector over here. And we then saw that the general solution to the traffic equations was that same vector plus an additional term. That additional term is going to be the element of the kernel. So I'll go back to the generalities now. Now, if x is one solution to the equation, then the other solutions are exactly those vectors that we get from that first solution by adding elements of the kernel. And let's see why that works. If x is one solution to ax equals b, and if w is in the kernel, then a times x plus w is ax plus aw. 
AX is B, AW is zero, B plus zero is B. So by adding elements of the kernel, we get more solutions and we get all solutions in this way. So just to go through our example again, here's the matrix for our running example. Its kernel is all vectors of the form T some scalar times minus one, one, minus one, minus one. Here's one solution to the traffic equations and the general solution is gotten by taking the first solution and adding an element of the kernel to it. How do you compute the kernel? You compute the kernel with row reduction. So let's see an example. Here is some matrix. Let's compute its kernel. We run the row reduction algorithm. In two steps, we get this matrix on the right here. So the kernel, just the definition of kernel, is it's the solutions to our matrix times some vector variables is the zero vector. The point of row reduction is that it preserves the set of solutions to the equations. So it's going to be exactly the same as the set of solutions to the row reduced equations. And we can parameterize the solutions to these row reduced equations using the free variables. So our pivot columns are W and Y, our free variables are X and Z. And so we go through the stand by now standard routine of parameterizing solutions using three variables. And we see that the kernel of our matrix is the set of all the new combinations of the vector negative two, one, zero, zero, and the vector eight, zero, negative four, one. So the kernel of this matrix is the span of these two vectors. Okay. And that's where we stop now. And so take a nice break and then come back to see the next video.